Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Miss Martha Scott in Rose Wilder Lane's Free Land on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we have a story admirably suited, I would say, to the mood of all of us tonight, the mood of thanksgiving. It's good to have this mood in which we can look around us and feel without any smugness or self-satisfaction that we are lucky people and that the luck began, as indeed most luck does, through hard work and sacrifice. These are among the great things we remember today. And few stories could be more appropriate than the one we present tonight. A story by Rose Wilder Lane entitled Free Land. And for that matter, there is appropriateness also in Miss Lane's having written this fine story, since she was born in the Dakota Territory, and her mother was one of the original pioneers who had come out from the East in the old homesteading days. This virile background lends an inspired quality to the story we tell tonight. And we are additionally privileged to have in the starring role one of Hollywood's most charming and distinguished actresses, Miss Martha Scott. And now, Frank Goss, would you take over for a moment, please? For a Christmas greeting your friends will long remember, make your selections now from the complete Hallmark collection on display at the Friendly Store where you buy Hallmark cards. Whatever your taste, whatever your budget, you'll take special pride in sending Hallmark cards. And on the back of every one is the identifying Hallmark that says, you cared enough to send the very best. Hallmark Playhouse, starring Martha Scott in Rose Wilder Lane's Free Land. Free Land. The phrase was on everyone's lips and it had an exciting, adventurous sound to it. One stood at evening looking west across the well-tilled, fruitful acres of Minnesota wondering about it. Wondering about Dakota and what treasures might be in store for those who went west to claim that free land. One stood and wondered if David... And then one turned and went quietly in and shut the door against the thought. To lose David would be to lose all hope for the future. I'm a little late getting here tonight, Mary. I was talking to my father. I wasn't sure you were coming, David. What's in the kettle? Apple butter. Mm, smells good. Where are your folks? They went over to Cousin Laura's. Uh, Mary, uh, do you have to stay out here in the kitchen stirring the jelly? Not jelly, apple butter. Yes, it might stick. Oh. Well, I, I wanted to tell you something, but I didn't want to tell you in front of a kettle of apple butter. I think you can depend on the kettle of apple butter not to repeat it. I'm going west, homesteading. Father's letting me go, and he's giving me white foot and star so I'll have a good team. And he's loaning me the money to start out on. Oh? Well, that's nice. That's very nice, David. I, I sure hope you'll be very happy. I'm going to Yankton tomorrow to file on a claim. For $14 and a half, I'll, I'll get me a quarter section. And I can have another quarter section by promising to set out 10 acres of trees and cultivate them for five years. I'll have 320 acres. 320? And then next week, I'm going out to take possession of the claim. I thought I'd build a shanty on it and then come back by Thanksgiving. For you. For me? Well, of course. You didn't think I'd go without you. Oh, David. David. Mary, I, I'm not one of those romantic guys that know how to make a lot of fancy speeches. But I do love you. And I'll do my best to provide for you and make a good home if you'll marry me. Oh, David, I'll be so happy to marry you. Oh, the apple butter, it's burning. Quick, help me take it off the stove. Burnt apple butter, burnt fingers, and burning beautiful sparks of excitement deep inside of me. 
And at last the words were mine that I'd been waiting for all my life. To have and to hold, to love and to honor, forsaking all others so long as we both shall live. It was Thanksgiving morning and the world was at its beginning. After the wedding, David and I got on the train and we were on our way to new country, new land, and a new life. At sunset, the ride ended and David took my arm and helped me across the frozen street to the hotel. Early the next day, David piled our things in a big wagon sleigh and we started for our claim. The strings of sleigh bells on the horses added a bright, gay music to the morning and it seemed to me as the horses raced towards the horizon that we were flying into the future and, and the whole world belonged to us. But in the afternoon, a level gray cloud began to stretch towards us and the wind began to rise. There's a railroad camp down there. I hope we can make it before the storm breaks. What do you bet we do? Hold on, darling. Hold on. When the storm hit, there was no direction to it. Winds came violently from all sides, even upward and down. The snow was blinding. The horses plodded ahead. Gradually, I felt the pain of cold leaving my ears and cheeks, and I rubbed them and slapped them. It was impossible to speak. Finally, the horses stopped. David shoved me out of the sled. Hang on to the sled. Don't let go for a minute. I'm going to cut the horses loose. They'll have to shift for themselves. Then we'll unload the sled and try to turn it over. Keep rubbing your face with snow, David. Not nearly as bad under here. It's funny, I remembered my father telling me about turning a wagon sled over once during a snowstorm and getting under it. I'm sure glad he told me that story. Pretty soon we're going to be buried in the snow. We'll make out all right. Snow is warm and there's air in it. We can live quite a while that way. Move over so I can put my arm around you. Love me. Oh, David, I love you more than any woman ever loved any man anywhere in the world. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'll bet you're the only woman anywhere in the world who told a man that under a sled in a snowstorm. Somewhere down underneath all this snow and is the land, our land. Someday we'll look out through our windows and remember this. You'll remember this snowstorm, Mr. Beaton. I'll remember you. Come on, Mary. Let me help you up. Is the storm really over? Come on out from under that sled and take a look. Hey there. Need any help? Peters. Mr. Peters. Came out to look for you. Your team drifted in three nights back. I got them stabled. Oh, much obliged. This is my wife, Mary. Hello. This is Mr. Peters, our nearest neighbor. Pleased to meet you. Your shanty's nine miles northwest of here. You better stop off at my house and get thawed out. <laughs> It was spring before we were able to go on to our claim. We lived with the Peters family through that long, blustering winter, and by the time we actually got to our land, we were a lot older and wiser than when we started. We rode up at sunset, and, and great sweeps of flaming color washed across the sky. Let me lift you out of the wagon, Mrs. Beaton. You're going to be carried across this threshold. The house was 12 by 12 with two doors, two windows, a floor, and a sod ceiling. David had stretched unbleached muslin neatly over the sod walls, and he'd built a prairie chimney solidly anchored with wires. The room looked light and clean. Do you like it? Like it? Oh, David, it's home, and it's beautiful. <laughs> How 
long are you going to sit there over that account book? It's late, and you want to get up early. I'm just going over what I spent in town today. Oh. $30 for a sod-breaking plow, fifty-two fifty for the cow, and the oats and the supplies. I have less than $200 left of the money my father loaned us to start out on. And I haven't broken one acre of ground yet. You and I have to live for 16 months on land that gives us nothing but grass. Oh, I've been meaning to tell you, in mid-November, maybe even Thanksgiving Day... Oh, that reminds me. I knew I had another package for you. It's in my pocket. Yeah. Here it is. Oh, David. Mrs. Peters thought you might like some silk to make some things. And I was wondering how I was going to tell you about the baby. Why, Mrs. Beaton... What made you think you'd have to tell me? I'm the father. You know, Mr. Beaton, I never once thought of that. <laughs> Furthermore, I told everyone in town that I was going to be a father. Oh, and David. Well, tomorrow morning I'm going to start breaking our ground. Spring came into bud and summer flowered. A green shimmer was over the land and whole stretches of meadow were carpeted with wildflowers. The lark sounded happy in the morning and the land seemed warm and tender and full of promise. But the prairie grass twined its roots into the soil and held on stubbornly while you tried to plow it. The earth gritted its rocks and refused to be turned over. The heat pressed down like a heavy weight on your shoulders and the wind tore and ripped at you every time you opened the door. David was up at dawn every morning to work his land. I'd be alone in the house with only the prairie wind to talk to. And I'd watch from the window for David to rest the team so I could take him a drink. Darling, you don't have to come out every time I stop. I like to, David. The water's brackish. Wish we could do something about it. The horses look worn out. You'll kill them making them plow this soil. I stop all I can to let them rest. Sometimes I think if there was just a tree. Do you realize we haven't seen a tree since we left home? I'm going to plant some. Well, maybe, maybe it isn't good land. Maybe No, the land's all right. It just has to be conquered. And I'm going to conquer it. Look, someone's coming. It looks like the Peter's wagon. It is, and Nettie's with him. Come on. Hello, Mr. Peters. Hey. Dave, we're making up a posse. That fellow living in the shingle roof lean-to south of town was a claim jumper. Yesterday, the man arrived who owned the claim, and the claim jumper shot him. Shot him? Where's the man that did it? He lit out right after the shooting. He's got a day's head start. Coming along. Quick as I can saddle up. Come and help me unhitch. All right. David, no. No. Mary. Don't do it. Don't go out and track a man down in cold blood. David, not you. Mary, the only justice we have out here is what we take into our own hands. That's the kind of a land this is. I hate this land. The outlaws don't murder you. The land itself will. That's all you hear, the land. The land, I'm sick to death of it. You die of the heat or you die of the cold. You die of starvation or loneliness or insanity. The land, I hate the land. It'll kill us all and then grow on top of us. I hate the land. Nettie. Take her up to the house. She doesn't realize it. it's the heat and the baby coming. Take care of her, Nettie. I know how you feel, Mary. The look on their faces. That unholy fervor to track down and kill. And when they come back, you know the man you've loved and honored has helped to kill a man. We have to have some sort of law. It'll be different when the country's organized. Sometimes I don't think I can stay another week. Sometimes I think I can't stand it. You'll get used to it, Mary. People get used to things they can't stand. Look at that sky. You have to say one thing for it. It's beautiful country. Only a few miles away, there's civilization and peace. And the people in the land are neighbors and friends. You're going back to Minnesota to have your child? Yes. David feels we couldn't manage here. That's right. Once the blizzards come, it might be impossible to get out here to help you. It's going to be good to go home. So good to go home. 
This is your home now, child. No, this is exile. Nothing can take root in this soil. People, least of all. In a moment, James Hilton will return to bring you the second act of Freeland, starring Martha Scott. You know, many people say that half the fun of sending Christmas cards is picking out just the right card for every person on their list. If that's the way you feel, then how pleased you will be when you see all the Hallmark Christmas cards now on display where you buy Hallmark cards. So many different ones. You'll find a card for every friend that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. There are Christmas cards with a Santa Claus so jolly you can almost hear him chuckle. Snow scenes so real you'll find yourself listening for sleigh bells. Christmas trees and holly as fresh-looking as mountain evergreens. There are cards that express the deeper spiritual meaning of Christmas, as truly as a carol sung on Christmas Eve. And these are only a few of the many different Hallmark Christmas cards awaiting you now at the friendly store where you find Hallmark cards displayed. Yes, whatever your taste, whatever your budget you'll find Hallmark Christmas cards that you'll be proud to send. Cards your friends will be proud to receive, too. For when they see the Hallmark on the back, they'll know you cared enough to send the very best. And now we present the second act of Rose Wilder Lane's Free Land, starring Martha Scott. David came back from hunting the claim jumper. He told me the man had escaped to Iowa. Had been arrested there and was being held for trial. We never mentioned it again. In October, the first blizzard stormed and lashed at us for five full days. And as soon as it lifted, David put me on the train for home. He planned to put things in order and then to join me in time for Thanksgiving, but it was April before another train was able to get through to that part of the country. I went back in April with my son in my arms. He's quite a boy, isn't he? He <laughs> certainly is. Mary, did you hate to come back? No. All the way back to Minnesota, I found myself thinking, I'm going backwards, not forward. I'm going backwards. And when I was there in a civilized house with all the things I thought I'd been missing, I suddenly found myself missing the prairie wind. And I knew beyond all shadow of a doubt that Dakota's become my home. Another year or two, and we'll really own something here. That spring was glorious, and down under, under the grass roots, David found soil that was dark and rich. He sowed his 14 and a half acres by hand, anxiously watching where the ever-present wind carried them. And when the seed sprouted and came up in a green mist, I stood in the doorway and wept to see it. And as the days passed, you could see the wheat begin to tame the land and the tasseled heads stretch taller and taller. We watched it, prayed over it. I don't like the looks of that sky. David, what are you doing up at this hour? It's the middle of the night. Out here, the stars always quiver in the wind. You never know when the wind will change. Rain on the pollen could mean disaster. Yesterday, you said it was getting too hot. I know. Yesterday was a scorcher. That could dry up the pollen before the kernels form. But nothing hurt the pollen. The kernels began to form. The fields, no longer silky, were covered with the young green heads. And the wheat was up to David's chest, and... When the wind rippled over it, it looked like light changing on a solid surface. It was there before our eyes, large, solid kernels, solid heads, 36 bushels to the acre, safe and sure, actual, true. 36 bushels to the acre? There's parts that'll run 40 bushels or I'm a liar. Mary, I tell you, this is the greatest country on God's footstool. Let the wind blow, let the sun blaze. The wheat is safe, the wheat is safe. David and Mr. Peters, helping each other, began mowing the wheat and tying the sheaves. There was no relief from the heat. And the dry earth cracked wide. 
They kept wet cloths in the crowns of their hats to ward off sunstroke. They worked day and night. They had only about six loads left to put up when... I ran outside with the baby in my arms. The crashing thunder was almost deafening. Overhead, a mass of black clouds was twisting and writhing with flashes of red and green light. I saw David and Peters running toward me and, and the dark mass in the sky coming down toward them. It's a cyclone, Mary! A cyclone! What do we do? It's gonna hit the earth any minute. We have no storm cellar! It's a well! We can't get down there. It's too small. It's open. Get down! Pat on the ground! Hold the baby under you! Here! Give him to me! Get down on the ground, Mary! Get down! It's all right. It's all over. You all right, Mary? I think so. How about you, Mr. Peters? Yeah. A little blown up, but alive. There's the rain. Come on, we got to get to the house. The house was still there although a lot of things in it were smashed and broken. And when daylight came, we saw the wheat stacks flattened and scattered, every sheaf sopping wet on the muddy ground. But there was a new consciousness of existence, of being able to breathe, to see light again, to walk across the earth. Whatever had been taken from us, a new appreciation of just being alive had been given in return. And now everyone set to work to save their fields. The water must be shaken from each sheaf. The sheep must be set upright in the muddy stubble and parted so the wind could reach the heads. We would save it. Please, God, we would save it. And then the thrashers came and the triumph, oh, the triumph of their coming. Dave, I've never seen grain to beat this. You haven't, eh? No, sir. Taste one of these kernels, Mary. Hmm? You can tell by the taste. Mm, it, has, it has a nutty flavor, hasn't That's it? That's right. And it's got the taste of good earth in it. A number one. And it's gonna run down near 40 bushels to the acre. Man's gotta go some to beat that, day. We had our first crop. Money to fix the roof, get a few pieces of equipment and some stock. We had a son, and soon we would have another child. We'd put our home on the land, and we would make that home and the land something we could be proud of. And then we had a letter from David's folks that they were coming out to visit us. David was happy about it at first, and then, after a few days, very quiet. I wonder what my father will think of the place. He never thought much of our coming out here. That's why I wanted to pay back the money he advanced as soon as possible. But we still don't have it. Oh, darling, I think your father will see the land just as we see it. And so David's father and mother, who had pioneered their land in Minnesota, looked over our pioneering in Dakota. And they didn't say much one way or the other until the last night of their visit when we were all sitting together, watching the long summer twilight deepen into night. How much would you say you're in debt, David, in round figures? Well, Dad, in round figures, about $900, besides what I owe you, sir. Mm hmm It's a good country. This farm's going to be worth something. Mm, I wouldn't wonder. Yes, you stuck it out, and now you've got something. Your mother and I are proud of you and Mary. David, did you hear that? Aren't you going to tell them, Jim? Oh, don't rush me, Mother. Oh. Fact is, my will's made out, David. It gives you and your sister an even share of the property I leave. As soon as we get home, I'm going to send you $2,000 and charge it against your share of the estate. Oh. Dad. That, well, I don't know what to say, but... We want you to have an easier time than we did. We are going to help you, and then in turn you will help your children. That's how families survive and how the country grows and expands. By helping you, we are helping a little in the development of Dakota. And when you help your children, they'll help push the frontier further west. You're right, son. It's good country. Long after David's father and mother had gone to sleep, we stood in the doorway, 
listening to the wind, savoring the warm summer, summer fragrance of the land, dreaming of what lay beyond it for our children. What are you thinking about? I was thinking how wonderful it was that we got this land. Funny. So was I. Well, you better get some sleep or we'll never be able to get up in the morning. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. We closed the door. The wind whispered to us and lulled us. And outside, the land waited. And I found myself thinking back five Thanksgivings ago. Five Thanksgivings when both the land and I were untried and unproved. When the land and I were enemies. And I began to pray that it was tamed now, broken to our plow, ready to work for us. I prayed that it would be for us and our children as it had been for our parents and our grandparents. That although the land had come to us free, we had paid for it with honest labor and passed it on to the next generation as a heritage. So that on future Thanksgivings, our children would be able to say, let us be thankful for all the rich fruit of the earth and sun that we have received. And let us be thankful for a free land a free country. In a moment, James Hilton and Martha Scott will be back. But first, may I remind you that Christmas is exactly one month from today. If you haven't already ordered your Christmas cards, better not wait any longer to visit the store where you buy your Hallmark cards. If you prefer to select individual cards for each person on your list, you'll find Hallmark cards that say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And there are Hallmark cards for imprinting with your own name and many boxes of assorted Christmas cards. Yes, whatever your taste, whatever your budget, there are Hallmark cards you'll take special pride in sending. And when your friends receive them and look on the back, as you did, they'll see the Hallmark and know you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. One of the rewards for giving a fine performance must be the real satisfaction of knowing that it pleased so many people. Tonight, Martha Scott, you should feel very happy. You've pleased us Hallmark people very much. And I know you've pleased millions of others around the country. Thank you, Mr. Hilton, and I, I guess you're right. There's a lot of satisfaction in the approval of the audience. Uh, by the same token, your Hallmark Playhouse must have won a lot of friends, like your Hallmark card. Well, we sincerely hope so. As a matter of fact, the Hallmark tradition is built on friendships. And we're going to try to add to that tradition again next week when we present Edna Ferber's great short story, Old Man Minnick, starring Victor Moore. And the following week, we present Woman with a Sword, starring Ida Lupino. The makers of Hallmark greeting cards and everybody at the Hallmark Playhouse join me in the hope that you've found much to be thankful for on this Thanksgiving Day. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Gene Holloway with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Martha Scott appeared through the courtesy of RKO Studios, whose current release is Stations West. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Old Man Minnick by Edna Ferber and starring Victor Moore. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week the Columbia Broadcasting System.